Scott is professor of biology at St. Joseph's University, where he teaches courses on biology, environmental science, and sustainability. He created and runs the Biodiversity Lab, and his research focuses specifically on animal behavior, ecology, and conservation. Many of his projects aim to build an understanding of the biology and life cycles of the threatened and endangered animals he studies with the goal of improving the odds of their survival. That work and a behind the scenes look at the lab will be the topic of these couple of talks and each will be focused on a different animal and um, aspect of his work. Scott also has a, a really long relationship with the Wagner he is part of our GeoKids Links partnership, which is between the Wagner and St. Joseph's University and brings hands-on science to elementary and middle school kids at North Philadelphia schools. Scott's given lots of talks at the Wagner. Some of you may have seen him. Um, he was recently our expert for an evening with an expert series about our amphibians and reptiles. And we really love having him as a speaker and are very grateful to Scott for putting together this digital series for us. Welcome to the Biodiversity Laboratory. I'm going to give you a very quick tour and show you some of the animals in here. We work with fish and turtles and frogs and insects. I won't show you any of the insects today. They're not that easy to film. I'll show you some turtles. This is a diamondback terrapin, one of the species that we do a lot of research with from the New Jersey shore. There are some fish. These are platys from Mexico. And we do quite a bit of research with them. We like these fish because they come in a variety of body colors. And we test that in our shoaling research that I'll talk about a little bit later. This is Marty. Marty's a bearded dragon and one of the more popular members of the laboratory. This is Bubba, a black pond turtle from India and an endangered species. Over here is Sid. Sid's a yellow spotted Amazon river turtle, also an endangered species, quite a large turtle. And this is Sid's brother, Manny, who's a bit shy. Many of the containers on this side are turtles, and many of the containers on that side are fish. We get lots of different turtles in here. Here's some younger turtles. These are cooters from Florida. These are Reeves turtles from Japan, also an endangered species. Here's some of the diamondback terrapins that are part of a research project right now. These youngsters will be kept in the laboratory for nine months to a year. And you can see they've got nail polish on their shells so we can tell them apart. And we study their growth and they will eventually be returned as part of a head starting program. Up here we have some shrimp a breeding tank for shrimp. Which are fascinating animals. This is a big South American fish which is part of a group that are called cichlids. And this is an Oscar. It's another large South American fish here. And then up here are two of my favorite fish. If I can get them through the glare. These are called silver dollars. And we've got a male-female pair. There they go. They're in the piranha family, but they, like many piranhas, are actually vegetarians, which is why they can live with lots of smaller fish. More of those little diamondback terrapins. A bigger diamondback terrapin. And now over here, lots of fish. Up there, we have fish from Mexico and Central America, tetras 
and also blind cavefish. These are some cichlids from Africa who are a little bit shy. Let's see if we can close up here. And lots of other tanks in here, lots of turtles. A soft shell turtle. More cichlids. Anyway, that was a very quick tour of the lab. And during these lectures at the Wagner, I'm going to talk to you about the research we do with many of the animals who are in here. Go through this. I'm going to talk about the lab a little bit because as you can see, it's a fairly unusual type of laboratory. It's kind of chaotic. And in a series of three separate talks, we're gonna talk about research we do in the lab on different groups of animals. Tonight, we'll be talking about the work that I do on fish. And I'm gonna go through the research relatively quickly. I'm gonna mention a few studies from the past. I'm gonna talk about some current work. I'm gonna talk about the behaviors that we look at in fish. I've also noticed just very quickly that some of the scientists working in my laboratory who've done this work are actually in the group attending tonight. And you know that I have a, a, a bit of a bad memory sometimes. So if I get the specifics of one of your studies wrong, make sure you correct me at the end. Um, so we'll go through this. I wanted to talk about the lab a little bit because that seems to be the, the basic cornerstone to these talks is the fact that the lab's an unusual place. And when I was hired at St. Joseph's University, I actually worked with fruit flies and I was a geneticist. And St. Joe's never saw this coming, but um, tenure is a remarkable thing. And I've essentially created the laboratory that I wanted when I was five years old. I've always wanted to be around unusual animals, frogs, toads, turtles, fish, and somehow I've managed to build that laboratory that I had. It really looks a lot like my rooms looked as I was growing up. The biodiversity lab is actually four separate spaces and this is the one that you saw in the film. This is the main laboratory. And it's a room where we keep examples of most of the animals that we work with. And as you saw, there's fish in there, there's shrimp, lots of turtles. Here's some of the Drosophila in bottles that I mentioned where we do some work with insects. And there's some lizards in there. Here's a poster session my students held in there uh, a year or so ago demonstrating their work in poster form and we just sort of put the posters around in between the tanks. The uh oh what am I hold on. Earlier today, like an hour ago, my computer completely crashed. Let's see if this works. Okay. The other the next part of the lab is another room. This is what I call the research lab. It's a slightly smaller space, but again like the first one filled with aquariums and this, like the name implies, is where we do a lot of our research. In the back are these test tanks I'm gonna be talking about tonight where we study fish behavior. We've also done some studies in there on fruit flies, and we've done some uh, studies in there on the amphibians. If you go downstairs in our building, you come to a, actually what is a suite of laboratories that we've managed to fill up with animals. And down here, we have some of the really large containers. This tank here, if you can see the pointer, this is actually nine feet long. So these are very big tanks. We've got goldfish in here. We have some South American fish over here, big turtle tanks over here. These are turtles that spend the winter downstairs in these tanks, and then they go upstairs uh, in the summertime. These are some albino turtles here, which are rather remarkable colors. And then the last space we have up on the roof of our building is a greenhouse. And the greenhouse houses big boxes and pens 
where we keep a lot of turtles. And it's some of them overwinter up here and they hibernate and some of them go up just uh, in the springtime and then spend the warmer months up there. So the, the biodiversity lab encompasses four separate spaces and every one of them is similar that it's packed with unusual animals, uh, but we do slightly different things in each one. And some of the species we have, again, just, I could put lots of snapshots together of the animals we have in the lab, but you see lots of frogs, turtles, and fish. Again, frogs, turtles, fish. This is Sticky up here in the middle, who's one of our more popular animals. Uh, some of the animals we have in the lab are not here specifically for research. Some of the animals we, hear are, are, we have here are actually rescues, and we didn't initially get in to this, uh, we, we didn't intend to get into this, but more and more often we run across animals that are in some bad situation and they ask if we can take them, and more often than not we do. So we've got a fair number of turtles that have actually been in the food trade, and we've got a number of other animals in the lab that have been in the pet trade and not particularly well cared for. Again, Sticky up here is one of them. Over here in the corner is Marty. Marty's a bearded dragon who's actually here with me tonight. Here's Mar Marty, go up there, say hi to everybody. <laughs> Marty spends his time in my office and when I'm in the office, he spends his time in my lap. <laughs> so, um, so lots of unusual animals coming in from a variety of different circumstances. And when I think about the laboratory and when I give talks about it, I usually talk about our work in contrast to what I refer to as normal science. So I'm a biologist. And by definition, I'm working with living things. So biologists are working with animals or plants or yeast or bacteria. And so there is something alive and they're asking questions about it. And when you think about that for many laboratories, you end up seeing what we talk about as model organisms. And these are species that have attributes that make them relatively easy to study, something you can maintain in the laboratory, something that you can get to reproduce if you need to have them reproduce, and something that either performs a behavior you want to observe, and that's what we do, or if you're a geneticist, an organism that's easy to manipulate genetically, or a microbiologist wants to look at something that's very small that they can study and ask questions about. But in almost every case, biologists look for organisms that are relatively easy to get and use. A classic example might be a white rat here in a box often used in psychology experiments for learning paradigms. And this animal is easy to get, they're easy to maintain, and they, they're very bright and they learn very quickly. So you can teach them that if they press the lever, they'll get food. And so you can ask questions about learning. What we do in my laboratory, though, sort of runs contrary to this. We have a few animals in the lab that I would consider to be good model organisms. We work with Drosophila that most people call fruit flies. We work with zebrafish, which have become a very good model organism. But for the most part, we are interested in biology in reverse order. Rather than having <coughs> a question and looking for the absolute best species to answer that question, we have an interest in particular types of animals and we get the animals, find ways of maintaining them and later find a way of asking questions about them. And for the most part, the species in my lab are not good model organisms. <clears throat> they're not easy to get, they're not easy to keep, and they're often not very easy to ask questions about. And so, we ask a variety of different questions. Some animals we can do better than others. Something like turtles, which is my childhood love, are notoriously awful species to study in a scientific lab. They're, they're very hard to keep. They're very messy. They get very big. 
they outlive you, which is a tough thing. <laughs> I mean, people working with, with fruit flies, you're going to have them for four weeks. It's pretty simple. The experiment's going to come to an end. A turtle, if you get it as an egg, it's probably going to live to be 85 years. And so that adds a, a different element to the idea of running these things in a laboratory. So we come about science slightly backwards and we're more interested in the species and then we get to the questions about them later. Now, once we created this laboratory, we've ended up going in four slightly different directions based on the types of animals. We do work on insects. This is again, what I started out here. That my training as a grad student was working with fruit flies and I still do that. And that's why I got hired at St. Joe's to study behavioral genetics and Drosophila. We also work with amphibians and we, we do some interesting work that has a slight relationship to climate change. And we're looking at effects of changes in environmental parameters on, on amphibians. We work with reptiles, such as the turtles and lizards. We do a few lizard experiments, but for the most part, the lizards come in as hard luck cases like Marty. And then we work with fish. And for the, for the fish, that has become the most commonly studied animal in my lab because we have created a situation where we can study them fairly easily. And the nice thing about the fish and the questions we ask is every time you ask a question or every time you answer a question, you end up with 10 more questions, which is exactly what a scientist wants. So tonight, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about social behavior in fish because that's what we're looking at. And when I think about social behavior, at least in my animal behavior course, I look at behavior from an evolutionary point of view. And for evolutionists, it's always a trade-off, benefits and costs. So whatever happens with an organism, what it does, what it looks like, where it lives, there have to be some benefits and there have to be costs. And these things play out in terms of natural selection. If something confers more benefits than costs, then chances are it's gonna happen. If an organism does something that confers more costs, then it's not gonna do that. So if you think about social behavior, and lots of species are social in some way. Some are very tight-knit groups, some are much looser groups, looser social aggregations. But for many species, at least in some part of their lifetime, they spend it with members of their own species. So you have to think that there must be some benefits to social be, so, sociality or social behavior. And for the most part, these things come in three main categories. The first is foraging. You're always looking for food. And it turns out if you're a single individual out there looking for food, you have just yourself to rely on and you might miss a lot of resources. It turns out that if you study species that are looking for food and hunting for food in groups, they find it more quickly and they communicate that to each other. So animals like these meerkats down here that have very tight social organizations, what they spend the whole day doing is looking for food and actually helping each other look for food. And so foraging becomes a major benefit to social contact. The second one is mating for sexual species. And again, not all animals are sexual. We've got a lot of animals in my lab that actually are asexual and they don't need to be in groups and they don't need to find mates. But sexuality is more common and so for sexual species you need to find a member of your own species. If you're in a group situation then there's a fairly good chance you're going to come across a potential mate. And then finally, well not finally, but there are many benefits, but the one we're going to spend some time talking about tonight is protection from predators. It turns out that animals in groups if they have predators they're worried about, they may be able to help each other. And for instance, these meerkats down here, while some of them are head down, nose down, digging in the ground, looking for food, they often have a sentinel who stands up on his or her hind legs and is watching the skies for hawks or watching the ground for jackals and is keeping an eye on everybody and then will alert them if a predator shows up. So you can get protection from predators from being in a group. Now, in terms of social behavior, whenever I talk about it, I'm fascinated by the terms that are used. 
it turns out that for almost every animal there is, at least every animal that gets in a social group, there's a name for the type of grouping. And I wrote a review article on social behavior a while ago, and I was collecting these, and they're fascinating. I've got more of these later we can do in questions and answers if you want to see more. But I always look at a few that are normal that we all know, and then a few that are unusual. So we all know these terms, some of them. So like birds, a group, if we were actually in a real talk, and I was looking out at you, I'd have you all responded. A group of birds is called a flock. Right? Okay, so we all know that. A group of wolves is a pack. We know many others. Now here's some that get to be a little bit more unusual, but these are three of the species, three of the types of animals we work in my, with in my lab. A group of flies, it's a swarm. I think many of you probably got that. Turtles is harder. This is a group of turtles down here. Turtles are not a particularly strong social animal but they do hang out together, at least on basking platforms like this. A group of turtles is a bale. A group of frogs, also not a particularly strong social organism. A group of frogs is called an army. I'm not exactly sure I understand that one. Now, that lead, again, I've got more of these, and some of them are spectacular. But um, it leads us up to this, and again, every... People have seen me give talks on fish before, and you know that I always do this. Imagine we're all in an auditorium together, and I say to you all, what do you call a group of fish? And what you're all supposed to do is you're all supposed to say, school. Now, I know many of you in this list know that that's not exactly correct. A school is right, but with uh, an asterisk next to it. The better name for a group of fish is a shoal. And anytime fish are together, it's a shoal. A school is actually a particular subset of a shoal. It's a special type of shoal. These fish here actually represent a school. A school is a group of fish, a sh a, is a shoal that moves together in a coordinated fashion. And they will go in the same direction. They'll turn typically very quickly together. They have lateral lines that run down their sides that allow them to sense the presence of the other fish. And so the correct term is a shoal, but sometimes fish are able to form schools and not all fish are able to do that. Now, when we think about shoal and behavior, and we go back to this idea of benefits and costs, now get ready, this is gonna be some really hardcore science. So I apologize, try to keep up because I know this is very difficult. So, <laughs> The, the basic premise here from a pre predator situation is that it's dangerous for a fish to be alone. The reason why it's dangerous for a fish to be alone is there's always a bigger fish. And so the situation we've shown here in this highly illustrative cartoon is a very bad situation for this little gray fish here because this fish behind it is a predator. And a predator in this scenario is going to be bigger. It's probably going to be stronger and faster. It's going to have lots of teeth. And it's got a situation here that it wants. The situation on the screen is exactly what that predator wants because predators are very interesting. They like to attack in a certain way. Every predator wants to hunt in a certain way. Some predators take you on face to face. Some predators come at you from the side and some predators come at you from behind. Almost every fish predator comes at its fish prey from behind. So the situation on the screen is terrible for the smaller fish. The fish behind it can see it, can chase it, can run it down and kill it because it's all alone and it's in a very dangerous scenario. And that's why being alone could be dangerous for a smaller fish. So what happens is you can join a group. It's safer in a group. So this is a group of little gray fish and the situation here poses a difficult problem for the predator. Remember the predator wants to attack from behind and it wants to see its prey. It wants to visualize it so it can get behind it and go at it and hit it exactly the way it wants. The situation on the screen now is a whole bunch of gray fish together 
And the idea here is that the predator has a difficult time picking out a single individual to hunt. So being in a group is safer. However, you've got to pick the right group. So these fish all look pretty good. But what if a little yellow fish swam into that situation there? That's not good for the yellow fish because that little guy stands out and the predator can still pick him off. So being in a group is important, but fitting into the proper group is the only way you get the advantage from it. So that little yellow guy wants to find a group like this. And now when he swims in and joins that group, he's got the benefits of shoaling and the predator is going to have a hard time finding him. Now these two phenomena, phenomena are what we call the confusion and the oddity effect. The confusion effect is when everybody looks the same and the predator has a hard time picking one out. The oddity effect is the situation we saw there where one individual is odd in a group and it turns out, and this has been studied in the laboratory, that if you let a predator go in a situation like this, almost all the time, the little fish that's going to get it is the one that stands out. So in the confusion effect, you join the right group and you get the benefits. In the oddity effect, you join the wrong group. Here's the, the gray fish here making a, a sad choice. So in our laboratory, we've been studying a couple of different things. The first is whether fish want to join shoals. And the second is whether they make the choices that we would expect based on the confusion and the oddity effect. We study this in these simple fish tanks. So here's one of our test tanks here. It's simply a 20 gallon tank. It has a glass wall here and a glass wall here. And what we do is we put the test fish in the middle. The test fish can swim around and now we can put different things on each, in each end chamber. We could put some fish here and maybe have this be empty or put one type of fish here and one type of fish here. The fish in the middle swims around and if it comes over here and it gets on this side of the white line, we register that it's making a choice to be near this chamber. If it ends up over here, we, may, we register this as making a choice to be what's ever in, in that chamber. We watch these fish for 10 minutes and we count the amount of time they spend on both sides. It's a nice situation for a behaviorist because the fish in the middle, simply by being in there, is giving you data. It's, you can create some quantitative data from this. So in our basic shoaling assay, where we look at confusion effects and oddity effects, we originally did this a long time ago with black and white mollies. Simple pit, fish you can get at the pet shop, same species, but they come in totally different color patterns. So we have black mollies here. And in this situation, the black test fish in the middle is being given a choice of a shoal of mollies here versus an empty chamber. The expectation is it will choose to be with a group of fish because again, there are benefits to being with a group of fish. If we put the fish into this scenario where it's being given a choice of white mollies versus nothing, it'll make this choice. Now that would confer the oddity effect, but what it shows us is it's better to be in a group than to be alone, even if it's not the right group. So you run those two assays and it sets you up to do the final assay where you give the fish the choice. What will the fish do in this situation? It gets a look at black mollies and white mollies. The expectation is it will choose to be with the fish that it blends in with. And in almost every scenario, that's exactly what happens. The fish make what we call the proper choice. They choose fish that they look like. If we run the same experiment with white mollies in the middle, they do just what you'd expect. They choose white mollies over nothing, they choose black mollies over nothing, and they choose white mollies over black mollies. It raises a very important question, and I don't have the answer to this question, and I never will. But that's the question of how does a fish know what it looks like? Because we ask these fish to make what we call the proper choice, and they almost always do. It could be a number of different things, and it's very hard to pair these things apart and really answer the question. There could be a genetic template, that is, they may be born with some innate genetic knowledge of what they look like. It may be learning, where they're put into a scenario and something happens, and if they choose the right group, they confer, it confers a benefit, and therefore that behavior is encouraged. Or it could be a phenomenon known as imprinting, which is slightly different than learning, 
and you simply key into an image you see when you're young and lock that in forever. Again, we don't know the answer to this question. It's the most important question to the work that I do, but we don't know the answer to it. We have done one study that shows that there is some plasticity to this behavior though. We've looked at the same black and white mollies I talked to, I talked to you about before. We get them to breed, and so we have a bunch of little black molly babies here and a bunch of little white molly babies here. And what we did with these fish was we would set them up into small containers. We would take a black molly and raise it with a group of white molly babies, and we did that, a, a whole bunch of them. And we did the contrary side of it. We would take little white molly babies and put them in with black mollies. And then we'd let them grow up and we would ask them to choose their shoal mates. If you raise a black molly in total, oh, the other part of this experiment was we'd raise babies in total isolation. If you raise a black molly in total isolation, it does what we normally expect it to do. But if you raise it with baby white mollies, it will then grow up and choose white mollies. And, oops, I thought I had another side, sorry. Um, the replicate, the other side of that goes exactly the same way. White molly babies raised with black mollies will then choose black mollies when they grow up. So we have this scenario where <clears throat> there may be a genetic component. Almost every fish we tested chooses the proper shoal based on phenotype, the way they look, the color. However, if you give them a certain type of experience, it may modify this behavior. And that's seen in a lot of other types of animals, including birds and mammals, that you may have a genetic predisposition to something, but you may modify that slightly with experience. Now, over the years that we've been doing this, we've looked at lots of different experiments having to do with shoal mate choice in fish. We've looked at phenotype, body coloration, pattern, shape, size. We've looked at lots of different species, sex, We've looked at familiarity. Fish not only like fish that they look like, they also like fish that they know personally. So if you take a whole bunch of zebrafish who know who all look exactly alike, and you give a zebrafish a choice between some zebrafish it used to live with and zebrafish it doesn't know, somehow it knows the ones it used to live with. There's been past studies, again, looking at phenotype different species. We've looked at cichlids, which are a predatory fish. They still like to shoal. We've looked at bettas, which are the fish you see in pet shops. Um, here's a betta here, this blue guy here. You usually see these poor things in pet shops. Uh, they fight with each other, so they sell them in these little sad cups. Um, we actually looked at them. They do what looks like shoaling behavior too. They'll go over to other males or they'll go to females. They may be going over there to fight. We looked at female bettas. They also seem to do some shoaling behavior, although they're fairly nasty as well. We did some work with glowfish, which are these genetically engineered zebrafish that have all sorts of wild colors. Oddly enough, with glowfish, this wild coloration doesn't seem to make any difference whatsoever. They don't notice it. They, they can't tell the difference between glowfish and regular zebrafish. We've looked at light dark cycles and found that shoaling behavior gets more intense as the day goes on. And we've even looked at personality. Fish have individual personalities. And when you do that, you group three behaviors together. Boldness, which is measured by a fish exploring new parts of the tank. Aggression, where a fish actually attacks a mirror. And then shoaling. It turns out these things are linked and fish that are more aggressive are also more likely to shoal, and fish that are more bold are more likely to shoal. So we've done lots and lots of stuff, way too much, and I'm already way behind in terms of time. I think this is supposed to end. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, but I wanted to mention fairly quickly some of the current studies that we're doing, and we've been asking a question lately, and it's gone in a lot of different directions, that has to do with shoal size. And it's related to a phenomenon called the numerical dilution hypothesis. The numerical dilution hypothesis is pretty, pretty simple stuff. It says that if you're in a group and that makes it less likely that a predator is gonna kill you for one reason or another based on confusion effect and so forth, there's also another phenomena associated with being in a group. And that simply is that the predator, if it's just gonna kill one of you, and you're in a group of two, 
50 percent of the time it's going to be you if you're all alone it's definitely going to be you if you're in a group of a hundred you've only got a one in a hundred chance of it being you so by numerical dilution the suggestion would be if you're given a choice between two different size groups do you pick the larger group you should get more advantage what happens is that is exactly true fish almost always choose the larger group. And that brings up another unusual question, and it's, can fish count? And the answer to that is maybe, but it's more likely that they can actually do division. Because what we find is that while fish choose the larger of two groups, the most important thing is not the number of fish in each group, but it's the ratio. And actually this work was done by a former grad student of mine, Paul Dortona, who I think is on here. Hi, Paul. Again, Paul, if I get any of this wrong, <laughs> let me know. Uh, Paul did some really terrific work with guppies looking at uh, shoal sizes and ratios. And in a phenomena where you see a two to one ratio, like four to two, this guppy will make what we call the proper choice. It'll choose the larger group. But if you give it a 1.5 to 1 ratio, 3 to 2, it can't make it. It, can't, it doesn't make a decision between those two groups. And we look at this across a whole lot. Of, you can look at 4 versus 2. You can look at 8 versus 4. You can look at 10 versus 5. And in these things, you can look at 3 versus 2 or 6 versus 4. Every time it's 2 to 1, they, make a cho they choose the larger shoal. Every time it is 1.5 to 1, they don't. We don't really know what that's all about, but it seems that that ratio is important. We've also replicated this whole thing with goldfish across a whole series of different number groups. It always holds up. Two to one matters. Now that led to another interesting study that's been done recently by a group of students in my lab that included, and I don't know everybody who may be on here, uh, Kennedy Sanders, who's a recent graduate from St. Joe's, Sean McDermott, who's one of my lab coordinators right now. Um, Kaylee Hamill was in on this, who's doing the last piece of work I'm going to talk about. And Kaylee McRobert, who happens to be my daughter, who was part of this study as well. They worked on this project last year and then during the summer. And in this, we looked at these fish called platys, which are wonderful. They come in these two brilliant color patterns, bright red and bright blue. They're Mexican fish. They all live together, all the same species. We, they do basic shoaling, as you would expect. Red chooses red, blue chooses blue. But what we did was we made mixed shoals. So this is a mix of red and blue and mix of red and blue. And we gave them the two to one ratio. Here's a two to one ratio of red to blue, two to one ratio of blue to red. And the fish make the choice you would expect them to make. This fish can choose the shoal that has more red fish in it in a four to one ratio, uh, I'm sorry, in a two to one ratio, but it can't do it under these, this scenario here where it's a 1.5 to one ratio. So we see this weird thing about ratios holding up in this unusual scenario here. The final experiment I wanted to mention tonight is the one that just got done by one of my uh, students, uh, a student named Kaylee Hamill, who's graduating this year. And we decided to do something very quirky, also working with platys. We decided to see what happens if we put two test fish in the middle of our test tank. No one has ever done this before. We actually didn't know why we were doing this, but as happens more often than not in my laboratory, we just throw ideas around and if something seems kind of cool, then we do it. And then later we try to figure out what it means. So we did this study and it's kind of cool and we're still in the process of trying to figure out what it means. But the idea is this, if you put two fish together in a basic shoaling tank, there's two different things going on. They're both looking at the end chambers to see whether they'll make a choice, but they also have a proximity issue. They have another individual right next to them. And we were looking to see if that phenomena had an impact on choices. And so here's a little bit of data that she did. The first uh, question we ask is, do they spend significant amounts of time together? 
irregardless of what's going on, and these four bars represent different things in the end chambers. Here, the end chambers are both empty. Here, it's a blue shoal versus an, em an empty chamber. Here, it's a red shoal versus an empty chamber. Here, it's a red shoal versus a blue shoal. And the asterisks up here tell you whether the two blue fish in the middle spend significantly more time together. Are they in the same part of the central chamber? And in almost every case, they do. So it doesn't matter what they're being given a choice of. They spend their time together, except when they're looking at a red shoal versus a blue shoal, it's the only time they separate enough that they don't spend significant amounts of time. It could be that there's so many fish in the tank that they're actually being drawn to different sides. Then the next thing we did, and uh, this made the, this weird study even more complicated, is we asked, what happens if we put you together in the middle chamber with a fish that you don't look like? So a red and a blue fish. And we asked the same question. Again, these are fish in these four different scenarios. Under these circumstances, the red and blue fish only spend time together here where there's an empty chamber on, there's no other fish in the tank. It's almost like I'll hang out with you because there's just nothing else. But in every other possible scenario, they don't spend significantly amount, a significant amount of time together. So proximity matters, but it only matters if you look like the fish you're with. And then the last thing we took a look, oh, and then this was the last part of that study. Again, the red fish and the blue fish looking at a shoal of red and a shoal of blue. Again, this is this bar down here. We asked one further question on this. We asked specifically where did this red fish spend its time and where did this blue fish spend its time? Because we know they're not together. And it turns out they do what you would predict. The red fish spends almost all of its time near the red shoal. The blue fish spends all of its most of its time near the blue shoal. So proximity with the wrong color fish doesn't work. If you see the shoal that you should belong to, you separate and you go join the shoal that you would fit in with. I just showed this because it's, it is a, an indicator of the times we live in. This was the last slide from Kaylee Hamill's honors defense. She was talking about possible sources of error. There's challenges with the testing methodology. We've never done it before. Challenges with the statistical analysis that we're still figuring out. And then global pandemic. She only, she actually couldn't complete her experiment because global pandemic. Um, now in conclusion, and hopefully I've made some sense here, we find that shoaling, which is a grouping behavior in fish, confers a number of benefits, finding food, finding mates, reduce, reducing predation risk, the size of the shoal matters, and you must choose your shoal mates correctly. And I'll end showing this, this slide and say now we can have time for questions. This was the slide I think it's called gold and silver fish. So it's a Chinese painting. This is what the Wagner put up to advertise this event. And I think as everyone will see, the fish in this are probably not making the choice that we would expect them to make, right? Okay, I hope this was great. It's kind of weird, but thank you very much. I really appreciate everybody logging in and I am, ready to answer questions, however the heck that's going to work. And um, yeah, if you have questions, send them in the chat. It looks like we have two to start out with. Um, the first is more general about the lab, and that's um, do you have special, or do you have to have special permits to work with endangered species? Yeah, uh, it's a great question about the endangered species. You have to have special permits, and the permission to work with endangered species goes at a whole lot of different levels. It's one of the biggest problems in conservation today is that animals and plants are listed as endangered or vulnerable or threatened by a lot of different organizations. Some of them are local. There's in Pennsylvania, there are laws about species that are found in Pennsylvania. There are uh, federal guidelines about animals and plants that are found within the United States. And then there's a thing called CITES, which is the Conservation on International Trade of Endangered Species, which looks at species on a global level. 
we have to satisfy the conditions of all three of those groups. So for instance, the turtles that we have from Japan that are endangered species, they have to be allowed out of the country, uh, out of Japan. And so Japan has to sign off on that. You have to have a federal permit to have them in the US and then you have to have a state permit to have them travel from one state to another. A lot of the turtles in my lab that are endangered, we get them from a, a, a conservation group called the Turtle Survival Alliance. And they're kind of the middle person for us dealing with animals from different countries. And a lot of our animals have to come into the country, uh, the South American turtles, the Indian turtles, they often go to the Denver Zoo, which is part of our little group. And from there, they get the permits to send them to Pennsylvania. It turns out it's much easier, sorry, Marty's upset. Um, it's much easier for me to work with animals from other parts of the world than it is for me to work with animals from the US. And it's almost impossible for me to work with species from Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania has incredibly strict laws. And so for the most part, I'm not allowed to study animals that I could find at a local pond. I, it's much easier for me to get something from South America. Thanks. Um, and on fish, someone asks, is there any mixing of the liquids and could there be pheromone effects? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. For our shoaling experiments, the shoaling tanks we have have glass dividers between the test fish in the middle and the end chambers and they're sealed with caulking and we do tests every so often to make sure that they're not leaky. So to answer your question, we don't know. We're trying our best to study fish shoaling behavior based solely on visual cues and that's not to say that pheromonal cues are not important. They're probably really important. But it turns out that in a small fish tank, a 20 gallon fish tank, it's very hard to study pheromones because if I put a fish in one end, it, it'll really be exuding some pheromones. And for a short period of time, it'll set up a gradient in the tank and the test fish may follow that gradient. But you can imagine that if you leave the test, if you leave the target fish in there for an hour or so, the whole tank might become filled with pheromones. And so we don't test pheromones because we don't exactly know what's happening. Anyway, the answer to your question is I say yes, I think absolutely pheromones are probably really important, but it's not what we're testing in my, in my experiments. Thank you. Um, someone else asks, and this is sort of related to the first question, but where do you get the fish and do they get released after the test? The fish don't, we don't take anything from the wild. If we, if we took something out of the wild, right, we would replace it. Everything we get comes to us from some commercial dealer. And it used to be we got them from these big commercial outlets that would send fish to pet shops. Sometimes we've actually just gone to local pet shops and bought them. But they're fish that are commercially bred. And once an animal comes into my laboratory, it, it, spends its whole life there. It, uh, we try to give everything in our lab a really good life. The lab, by the way, has one basic premise, which is more important than science, is we have a tremendous respect for the animals. Every single, even every guppy is special to us. And all of my stu students are smiling because they know that that's the case. And um, we treat everything as, we never do any experiments that hurt anything. And once an animal is done in its studies, we, we set it up somewhere and we try to take great care of it. So it never goes anywhere else. That explains your tank of misfits. Most of the lab is misfits, including me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, a reminder, if you have questions, send them in the chat for me to sort through them. And um, another question is, are your kickwoods are wild caught or captive bred, which um, I assume they're captive bred based on what you just said. And do you see a difference in the predatory styles between uh, wild caught and captive bred ones? You know, we, we tried to do a couple different experiments with wild caught fish. And we, 
we had laboratories that we were collaborating with and both of these labs had field stations in Costa Rica. And at one time they had guppies that were sent up. They were captive, uh, I'm sorry, they were collected in the wild. We brought them into the lab and we, we studied them. And then one was a cichlid, a predatory fish that was brought up. And in both cases, it didn't work for us scientifically because you didn't want to take that many fish out of the wild. I don't like taking anything out of the wild. So we had a small group that came up to the lab. It really worked. We didn't have enough fish to ask a good question. We could breed them and look at their offspring, but for the most part, we didn't, we didn't think we were getting any great answers. So the only two times we worked with things that were brought out of the wild, we didn't get, we, we weren't really able to study them. The idea of whether you would see a difference between them and a captive bred species is an absolutely terrific uh, question. But the way we're set up, I, do, I don't exactly know how to answer it. Um, any other questions about fish or the lab? It looks like um, that. And we just posted the link for the next week is going to be about um, mating behavior in fruit flies. So I'll put that in the chat. Um, and this was also recorded. So if you want to go over anything, um, we'll send out the recording too. So I just, I want to thank Scott, a last minute request, if he wants to hold up Marty one more time so we can all see him. I'll hold up. <laughs> he hasn't escaped. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Marty. There we go. Um, I just want to thank Scott for putting this together. It's fantastic. Um, and echo what Corinne said, and thank you for handling the questions, Corinne. The second in the series will be the sexual behavior of Drosophila, as I understand it. You can join us for that fascinating session. And um, Corinne mentioned the link. For those of you who signed up, of course, through Eventbrite, you can sign up again for next week's through Eventbrite. Or, um, and if you want our e-newsletter to keep posted on all of this, um, you can sign up on the homepage of the Wagner's website. And I want to last just say, um, we bring you all our programs for free. We thank those of you who made a donation. If you're interested in um, becoming a member, you can also do that on our website. And we hope to see you next week for part two of Life in a Biodiversity Lab. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Scott. Hey, thank you, Thanks, everyone. Corinne. Thanks, everybody. Good night. <laughs>